Well, good to see you this morning. May the Lord bless you. And it's been an interesting morning around here with the uh, baptistry there. I got here about 5, 15, 5.30, and the baptistry is just about one inch from overflowing the top. And I thought, uh-oh. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I run down here to... Uh, get the, my boots on because I'm going to pull the plug and get as much water out of there as I could. And I, uh, I looked underneath it and I could see the overflow was just leaking. We had about a thousand gallons of water on the floor underneath the baptistry. So I ran down here to get my boots on, my waders, and there are no waders. Couldn't find it. I thought, I've got to do it now. There's no time. I ran back up there, I took off my clothes, and uh, I, it's 5.30, you know, so I thought, okay, here we go. So I, I get, I kind of ease in there because my, wa my body's going to displace the water over the, the glass. And so I get in there, finally get it pulled, I thought, you know, if I die in here, because, oh, it was cold. I mean, the water's, I, I said, if I die in here, I can see the day of Oklahoma, 71-year-old pastor dies buck naked in the baptistry. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm fully dressed now and it's all dry, all right? But, so I've had, a lot of you know I love to go swimming, all right? I, I went swimming this morning, <laughs> so it didn't cost me a dime. So, uh, but it's, um, I found a towel stuffed down in the um, overflow, got that out. Well, I think we're, we're going to baptize this morning, so that's not going to slow us up, amen? So we have, uh, uh, Brother Travis is going to baptize some of his first people here, so it's going to be great. We're grateful you're here. Let's have a moment of prayer, and we'll get started. Father, we thank you that you're always with us. You never leave us, and you never forsake us. Father, do a work here today that can only be explained by yourself. Thank you for Jesus. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Thank you, Father. Amen. If you're a guest, we are indeed grateful you've come today. God bless you. Just remain seated. In a moment, our church family will stand. We want to greet you. If you'll take a part of your bulletin, says, let's get acquainted. Please fill that out. There's a great big old box back there. Uh, we call it the chest of Joe Ash. That's where you place offerings and also those, any cards there, prayer request cards, et cetera. God bless you. Please remain seated if you are a guest. When we start singing, everybody will stand. So thanks for coming. God bless you. Be seated, guest, church family. Let's stand. Let's say, my, you look, uh, you smell good today. Amen. My friends, I am so excited today. We have the right way to start off a church service. Amen. A couple of brothers in Christ. Amen. of faith. It's been amazing to see these young men come along and the Lord has been working powerfully in their lives. Amen. Thank you, sir. I will not drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> it is a wonderful thing to have you all in this place. It's even better to have my two brothers in Christ who are about to join me right now. I'm going to ask Brother Ben. Brother Ben Mickey to come into this nice, cool water. <laughs> Brother Ben is 17 years old. He has been a Christian for a while, but he has not been baptized as an adult of his own free will. And he came to me, I'm telling you something right now, he came to me a couple of weeks ago with a word in his heart from our Lord. He actually taught our youth last Wednesday night. He did an awesome job. And today he comes to share in believers' baptism just the way our Lord Jesus showed us to do it. Let me set this mic down. I'm going to talk loud. Brother Ben Mickey, what are we doing here today, sir? I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior and as my Lord. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And then it is my honor to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ, raised to 
brother Connor Reinhardt joined me in here, brother. He's got a busted up ankle. Is it better if I'm on this side of you? Come on in, pal. Be careful. Take your time. Take your time. Oh, look at there. I did it. All right. Brother Connor. Connor Reinhardt, 21. Met him at Gold's Gym. He was doing legs in a way I could never even try. <laughs> Caught my attention. We've been friends ever since. What was that about two months ago? Yep, something like that. Amen. Connor, what are we doing here today, sir? I'm trusting Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My brother, it was an honor for me to baptize you, my brother in Jesus, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. is right. Amen. I also get to get, do some really fun announcements today. Ugh, it's hard to shake this off. Not only is the water cool, but there's nothing more important than have your brother say, Travis, let's do this thing like our Lord showed us. Oh, I'm shaking over here. It's so good. Anyways, we have a really wonderful week coming up this week, my friends. We have the men's prayer group in the morning, 9 a.m. I can't stop bringing it up. I can't stop bringing it up. I bring it up every Sunday, men's prayer, 9 a.m. Monday, because it's important. These men of God show up, and they look each other in the eye, and they claim Christ over their families, and over this church, and over our youth, and over our country. Amen. And it's some of the most powerful moments I've had inside this building. So please join us if you can, men, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. I know everyone can't come. You got work, okay? But at least you can be praying from where you are, all right? We have, uh, oh, a really, really awesome thing starting this Wednesday night. We're going to have our snack supper Wednesday night starting this week, 5.15 p.m. It's going to go for about an hour, okay? Uh, so come and bring, bring your appetite, bring your kids. We're going to fill that fellowship hall. We call it a commons area. We're going to fill that commons area up with folks, and soon it's going to be overflowing with people Amen. trying to celebrate Christ with us, okay? We're also going to, uh, let's see here, we're going to have our choir practice start at 7.30 this week and from here on out. We're going to give them a little more time to get this ministry just a big fat boost. And let me tell you something else. If you can, walk up here and sit among the choir members. Join the choir, okay? Join this choir. Because you know what we're doing up here? We're worshiping the Lord together, okay? Some of them are better than others. I'm the worst. I'll be honest. I've told you before, I'm not a singer, but I like to stand next to my pretty wife and make a lot of noise for our Lord, okay? Amen. And if you come stand here and you will support this ministry, and basically what singing to the Lord is, is praying Amen. in unison, right. and it's good, okay? So 7.30 Wednesday night is our new choir time, all right? It'll be over by 8, 8, 15. Uh, youth group, Awanis, nothing's changed. Starts at 6.30, goes till 7.30 or 8. You know, nothing's changed there, so no big deal. Uh, please bring your kiddos to that. It's probably one of the most successful ministries we have right now. Chelsea and Nathan are doing a great job in there. Miss Hannah, all of them just killing it. Um, let's see here. We have a really cool youth event coming up next Sunday uh, after church, 3.30. We're all going to go to Frontier City. We're going to meet here in the church parking lot at 3.00. 30, and then we're going to head on over to Frontier City. It's called Ride for Christ. And if I need an excuse to ride a roller coaster, I'll call it Jesus, and we'll, we'll do that. Well, that's what we're doing. And we're going to have, there's a, there's a concert for the, for the Lord going on there, a bunch of Christians. It's going to be a good fellowship opportunity, okay, next Sunday. And then, now I'm going to pass it over to my friend, Miss Jeannie Maxwell. She's going to do a special announcement for the mother-daughter banquet. Thank you, Miss Jeannie. Uh, our mother and daughter banquet is May the 10th at 6.30. We have uh, 32 signed up so far, but we always have 75 to 100 in attendance. So I'm hoping you uh, sign up and sign up your daughters who are coming too. It's not just for mothers and daughters. I say this in the bulletin, we do it on announcements, but it's for every woman, uh, friends, neighbors, uh, our sisters in Christ, uh, if you're here and you're a Christian, we are sisters in Christ, and it's really for everybody. You will not feel left out if you don't have a, a daughter or mother with you. 
Um, you may be like me, my mom is in heaven, and, but I'm gonna have my daughter and granddaughter here, but if you, we would love to have you uh, at 6.30 on that Friday, May the 10th. We only have two more Sundays after today to sign up, and we have the deadline is April the 28th. Also, just two things real quickly. Uh, Brother Travis said about Wednesday night we're eating from 5.15 to 6.15, but Dan is now only going for an hour from 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday nights, and the youth are gonna be the same way, 6.30 to 7.30. Awanas will stay 6.30 to 8, but uh, now church will only be for an hour, and that gives choir even uh, earlier time to start practicing at, at 7.30. But also, the last thing, we have a staff member, I didn't know he had a birthday yesterday until after the bulletin was already done, but uh, would you get Michael Inks uh, in here? But uh, we missed celebrating his birthday, and I would have put in the, uh, the bulletin, but I want us to sing, can we sing happy birthday to Michael Inks? Let's see if he's out there. And he's, he's what? He went to the nursery, okay. Well, uh, Let's sing happy birthday, and his mom can tell him we sang happy birthday. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God, it was one of, Michael is one of our maintenance guys, and we thank God for him. And uh, he just gone through back surgery himself, so bless his heart. Well, thank you so very much for being here today. Um, you know what? In, uh, in order, we're going to take our offering right now, so just uh, give as God blessed you, and if you have a need, feel free to take and we always that's how we do that and if you'd say well i don't have it ready right now you can put it in the chest as you go out if you would let, rather do that so it's however you'd like to do it but we like to do it because the bible tells us to bear one another's burdens and we want to do that but we, we also i want to pray for the nation of israel and uh and what's going on there right now i don't know if you know it last night but iran sent not only drones but they sent ballistic and cruise missiles to uh, destroy israel and um, thank god that the lord uh, took care of most of all that there and uh, i'm uh, grateful and uh, you know how i love israel and uh, the people there and so i uh, i ask you let's go to the lord father i want to thank you for this day thank you for this offering god Everything you give us, we're so grateful. We give back our tithes, our offerings, because we love you, God. Not because we have to, but because we want to, because we get to. Lord, I do pray for the nation of Israel. I pray God should thank you that Michael looks over it, that these are your people. If we bless your people, we'll be blessed. Oh, God, I pray help the leaders of this country to awaken themselves to recognize Israel doesn't need us but we need to bless them because whoever if I whoever curses me I'll curse is what you were if blesses me I'll bless you oh God the Abrahamic covenant is so clear and God we just I want to thank you not just because I'll get a blessing but because this these are your people who brought about Help us bring into this earth the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you. Thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen.
be seated. The choir wants to present a song today that uh, we have come to love. It's The Blood of Jesus Speaks for Me. Is that not a great title? Amen. The blood of Jesus is powerful and effective in cleansing us from our sins when we confess them. This is the speaking that God hears and takes heed to. Hebrews 20, I mean 12, 24 says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling, which speaks something louder than that of Abel. In Genesis four, Cain killed his brother Abel. God then told Cain, the voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Hebrews 12, 24 tells us that today, the blood of Jesus speaks something better than Abel's blood. The blood of Jesus Christ not only redeems and purifies, it speaks to God for forgiveness, justification, reconciliation, and redemption. If you know this song, join in with us as we sing it. It's a simple song, but it's so powerful. Let's stand and continue our praise time.
the Lord so beautifully. And you all sang really well this morning, too. God bless you. I was up late last night listening, and uh, as I, I get a, te a telegram on my phone from the IDF from Israel. They send it to me. I probably received four or 500 videos last night watching uh, uh, as it was happening, the issues there in Israel. And so I just ask again for your prayers. I have many friends and love uh, people there that I'm praying for today. So uh, this morning we pick up here in Genesis chapter 42. Folks, in the next few weeks, we are in for a wonderful blessing because these are some of the greatest passages of the Old Testament. I can, I can just tell you that right now. It's, it just blesses my, my socks off just to, just to have the privilege of preaching this and teaching this to you this morning. It's like I've never done it before. It was on October the 29th, 1941, Winston Churchill spoke to a school that he used to be the headmaster of. And then a few years later in front of parliament, he gave the same speech. It is called the greatest speech ever given. And Winston Churchill gave it there at the darkest time in England as they were, looked like they were going to be overtaken by the Nazis. He got before his countrymen, and here's what the speech goes. Never give up. Never give in. Never. And I'm going to try to be him. Never. Never. And he sat down. I tell you what, that's the life of Joseph. Joseph. This boy would not give up. He wouldn't back up until he, he wouldn't shut up until God took him up. <laughs> Amen. So he was, uh, and I'm entitled this message today, never give up. Just don't do it. And, um, you know, he was sold as a slave to the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, however you want to call them. And so uh, he was sold from his brothers. They were going to kill him, but then they sell him. And then, then he becomes a slave in Potiphar's house, as you know, but he becomes faithful there, and pretty soon he's running the whole house. And then he's falsely accused by uh, Potiphar's wife uh, that he uh, abused her or raped her, whatever you want to call it, and none of that is true. He's put in prison falsely. He's there for anywhere from 10 to 12 years. We don't know the exact amount of time there. And... Um, and uh, but now God's going to use him in unusual ways. And we saw last week how he was brought out of there, and one day he goes from the dungeon to the second most powerful person in the world. I've also gave you last week uh, biblical archaeology that's gone back and found the actual writings about Joseph and about this Semite that became the mouth of the world. That's what they call him, the greatest spokesman of the world is what we find in Egyptian archaeology today. So may I just say to you, the life of Joseph is the greatest biblical example, in my estimation, of Romans 8.28, especially in the Old Testament. Eight, Romans 8.28, most of us can, uh, we can quote that, and that uh, <clears throat> all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. It didn't say all things are good, but it says they all work towards good. Amen? Now, in the Greek language, that's not two words work together. It's not two words. It's one word. I put it in your notes, I think. Um, you, let me, I'll pronounce it for you. Sunar geo. Soon air ageo is that word. We get our word synergy from that word. You say, well, what's synergy? Well, Colin Brown in his um, uh, uh, dictionary on uh, Greek words says this, and <clears throat> uh, I like it because it's, I don't understand it all. I like these guys that are just, they're so brainiacs, they're way out there. 
So working together of various elements to produce a result greater than the sum of those elements, unquote. That's what Brown says, and I, that's what it is. About the best way I know how to do it, and just simple way I, you know, I, uh, I took a little chemistry in high school and in um, uh, college too. And so um, it, it's sort of like sodium chloride. Both of those by themselves can harm you. I mean, it's dangerous, it can kill you. Put them together and it's table salt. And done in moderation, it makes things taste better. Amen? It's synergized. You can take things that are dangerous, stick them together, and something good comes out of it. All things, not a few things, I want you to apply it to your life. If you are following the Lord, the Bible says not just, now you got to wait for God to bring it all to conclusion. All things work, not a few. We could probably get along with that verse easier if we could say most things work together. Didn't say most things. All things. All things work together for good. To them that are love God and are called according to his purpose. Joseph, his whole life looked like it's in shambles. I mean, think about it. For 13 years, he's a slave. He is a, a, a prisoner. Uh, it, it looks like he's going nowhere fast. And look what God does. He takes all those things, like sodium chloride, and boom, he puts him, and now he's saving the world. His name is changed from Joseph to Zephia Pania, which means savior of the world. God works the sum of circumstances in our lives for good, even at times when we can't imagine how in the world could this be good. Amen? Uh, I couldn't figure that out this morning when I'm out there threshing around in the I thought, oh, man, I sure hope nobody walks in here. And so it uh, would uh, uh, be hard to explain. And then it, uh, someone said, well, maybe we got it on camera. I thought, oh, no, you don't. I'll break that camera, that's for sure. <laughs> so, 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 uh, but God works the sum of circumstances in our lives for good, even though we can't always figure it out. Uh, Joseph will ultimately, he said, he's going to say this. You meant it for evil to his brothers, but God meant it for good. That's where we're go hid to. We're, we're going there. We hadn't got there yet, but we'll get there. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, Dr. Reuben A. Torrey, most people call him R.A. Torrey. I thought I'd use his first name, Reuben. Romans 8.28, he says this, quote, Romans 8.28 is a soft pillow for a tired, weary heart, unquote. Dr. Torrey had it right. It's a soft pillow for Christians that are weary and tired. All things work together for good, amen? Yes. Romans 8, 28, it did, like I said, it's not a few things, no, it's not most things. If, if you let God run your life, then you can rest on this wonderful pillow with your tired heart, amen? I like the book of Job. We went through the entire book of Job on a Wednesday night. That wasn't easy, I guarantee you. I've never preached verse by verse all the way through that. There's a lot of repetition, but I tell you what, a lot of great truths. Job chapter 23, of course, Job played in the um, Super Bowl of uh, uh, going through difficult times. So Job 23.10 said, God knows the way that I take. And when I come forth, I, he will make me as gold. Amen. Now, that's true. He says, he's testing me, but I'm going to come out of this like gold. He didn't understand how. That's up to God. Let me say this. That's what's going to happen to Israel. Yes. And friends, listen to me. Don't worry about Israel. God looks after Israel. In fact, the Bible tells us that Michael the archangel, that's his number one word, that's his concern, is to look after Israel. I'm concerned about America. I love this country. But I guarantee you, we, God has blessed this country because God says, if you bless my people, I'll bless you. But if you curse them, I'll curse you. 
And when we walk away from Israel as our ally, this country is in great danger. I fear God a whole lot more than I fear anything else in this world. Joseph will look back and see God's perfect plan. And, and, you know, that's what happened with Job. He says, though the Lord slay me, yet will I serve him. I don't care if I, he said, that's as far as I'll go if the Lord slay me. <laughs> How far are you willing to go? Well, if I lose my job, I'm done with God. If I lose my girlfriend, that's it. You know, check in. God, Job said, if the Lord slay me, yet I'll keep right on serving. Amen. I'm going to keep going even though I don't understand it all. What is your limit in trusting God? If you lose your job, lose your mate, sickness, you know, all kinds. How far will you trust God? Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Joseph went from riches to rags and back to riches. <laughs> uh, you know, some are okay with adversity, but other people can't handle prosperity. Joseph holds the checkbook of the entire world in his hand. He has Pharaoh's signet ring. It's more than an American Express gold card, like I mentioned last week, because he can not only buy anything, he can do anything with that. Uh, he has the authority of uh, Pharaoh with him. Some people can't handle prosperity. There was a lady in 1985, her name was Evelyn Adams. And she won the New Jersey um, jackpot, whatever you call it there, you know. And, and she won it in 1985, and she won it in 1986, two years in a row. You said, well, something's going on there. Well, they checked, and it, this poor little lady, she, she won them two years in a row, boom, boom. And I hate to tell you, she died penniless in an old broken-down trailer. And she said, before she died, she said, I, I never learned to use the word no. So many people came asking for stuff, and I couldn't say no. And so, uh, but so many people can't handle prosperity. They can't handle difficulty. There's other things. Let me go on here. Let's go here now. Look, the brothers go to Egypt. Here they go. It's been, uh, Joseph's 39 years old now. He was 17 when he left there. That's been 22 years ago. I put down 21 in your notes. It's actually 22. Um, since Joseph was sold to the Midianites there. And so, uh, <clears throat> so and there we see the, they're in their second year of the seven uh, years of famine. They've already had seven years of great prosperity. So probably year two of the seven years of famine in Egypt. And so the, the brothers look at each other. Notice here verse 1 and 2. He says, when Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, now, <laughs> I can just see him doing this at a breakfast table, why are you guys looking at each other? I mean, here's these 11 boys all looking like, who's going to, we're, we're dying here, we don't have any food. <laughs> he said, Look, we, let's quit looking at each other and do something. It's time to hike the ball. Good night, nurse. But, uh, um, so verse 2, and he said, indeed, I have heard. Now, remember, they don't have cell phones. They don't even have email. It's amazing. Indeed, I have heard through the caravans that there is a grain down in Egypt. He had no idea that it's his son is the reason that grain's there. Of course, it's God. But go down to the place, to that place, and buy for us there that we may live and not die. <laughs> so uh, praise God. So nobody seemed to talk about the famine. They're just all sitting around looking at each other. Anybody going to do anything? Anybody going to do anything? Well, uh, finally Jacob just says, somebody better do something. It's, it's time that, you know, let's get on with it. So when you hear a promise from God, act upon it, and your faith will grow. Have you noticed that? Even though you can't understand it always, it will have faith comes by hearing and hearing by, guess what? The Word of God. That's why you can go to many churches and hear sermonettes for Christianettes, but here you're hearing the Bible. And we teach the Bible in classes. We, that's why, because I don't know anything else God will bless. I'm afraid to do anything else. 
So uh, uh, Jacob does not know uh, it's his own son down there that is through God that is, is the reason there is grain there. So here's some facts to think about. You know, 10 sons travel to Egypt. Not 11, 10. Going to keep Benjamin back. That's over 300 miles. It will take at least six weeks to get there and back. And so uh, from, from Israel. Uh, they will not meet Joseph because they think he's dead. They're going to meet a guy named Zapiath Paniah. And uh, he's... Uh, if we're going to get some Chick-fil-A down there, um, he's the guy with the, with the order blank. He's the one that's going to get it to you. If you want some chicken strips and waffle fries and a banana shake, that's about the only way you're going to get it. Amen? And don't worry. You, they're closed today, folks, so don't worry about trying to get with any of that. So. But, uh, but uh, he's the one in charge. Amen? So uh, Joseph uh, will recognize these boys, his brothers, but they won't recognize him at all. There's no way they could. Joseph was 17. Now he's 39. He's a grown man. He's wealthy. He is an Egyptian, an Egyptian culture. Um, uh, he's got a big job. He's married. He's got two sons. He's got a two camel garage. I mean, he has got everything going for him. And uh, Benjamin doesn't travel with them, the youngest brother. Now, that's Joseph's full brother but from their mother. She just had two boys, Joseph and Benjamin. Then she died with Benjamin, remember? Uh, that was Rachel. So Benjamin does, doesn't travel because dad doesn't want to send Benjamin because he does, he's afraid to lose him. Verse 3, so Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but jo Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. I can't, uh, I can't stand to lose him. He's the last of the Mohicans from Rachel, and Rachel's dead. That's his most beloved. He had four wives, but she was the one he loved. And the sons of Israel went to buy uh, grain among those who had journeyed for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the favorite son, as Joseph had been, but now, like I said, that was the son of Rachel. Now it's Benjamin because he's the only one left there. Uh, now, let me just say this to you. If Egypt is having famine, it's 10 times worse in Canaan because the, uh, what, what happens in the famine there in Egypt is because of the Nile River. But up there, it's with rain. They don't get the uh, the Jordan River, they have a little Jordan. The first time I ever went over the Jordan River, our guide, Abraham Hillel, he's, he looks back, he said, Pastor Dan, look real quick, uh, you'll, you'll miss the Jordan River, we're going to grow over it. And I, I, it's like Deer Creek. I mean, good night. It's like Chisholm Creek. I go, what? Is, that's Jordan River? I couldn't believe it. It's a little bigger than, than Chisholm. I'm being a little facetious, but not much. I mean, you think, I'm thinking like, you know, the Mississippi or something like that. It's anything but that. So uh, <clears throat> let me quickly move on here. Notice the famine in Egypt is severe and the famine in Canaan. Verse 10, for the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt. Now, I'm reading to you from Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 10 and 11. I want you to see this. It's very important. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot. How many of you farmers water your crops by foot? They say, well, that's got to be a typo. Oh, no, it's not. It's exactly what the Bible says. Because in the Egyptians, they pumped water the, the, the Nile would flood and so it would go out into the uh, Mediterranean uh, Delta and it would flow back and they would take ribbits and they, would, and they would have to pump it out of those ribbits into their field. And so they had wheels that they would go walk on. Sometimes they had places where they would pump. I've seen pictures of it. So it's all by foot. It's exactly what the Bible says. And so uh, by foot as a vegetable uh, garden, they were very ingenious. But the land which you are going to, to the land of promise, he's telling them, 
over to possess as a land of hills and valleys, which drinks waters from the rain of heaven. I'm the one that's going to send down, I'm going to bless you with rain. And so, and you farmers understand that there. Egyptian, the Egyptians relied upon the flooding of the Nile, but the Canaanites, when they lived in Canaan, it's because of the rain. And when there's no rain, there's no food. So we see this dream fulfilled. His brothers come to bow down to him, verse 6 and 7. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. What is going on in Joseph's mind right now? I think he goes back to a dream he had when he was 17 years old, that the, uh, the sheaves will bow down, that's the... Uh, the, the, the produce of the world will bow down to him and his 11 stars, that's his brothers, they also will bow down. Uh, which one of them, of course, would... Uh, <laughs> wow, here it is, it's happening. But it, he's only got 10 of them there. One's missing. Benjamin's missing, the... Verse 7, Joseph saw his brothers, and he recognized them immediately. But he acted as a stranger to them, and he spoke roughly to them. Immediately he has a plan. I've got to test these guys to see where they are. Are they still, you know, trying to kill me or uh, other things? Or maybe, they're, maybe they're doing that to Benjamin. Then he said to them, where do you come from? Now, he's speaking through an interpreter. He's speaking Egyptian, but they, um, an interpreter is speaking it to them in Hebrew. And they said, from the land of Canaan, we're here to buy food. Uh, the, the brothers did not recognize Joseph, verse 8. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. They had no way they could recognize He's in his white royal robes that the Egyptians wore. He had one of those... Uh, things around his neck, you know, a great big old wide band of things there. He pro he's shaved. Now, when it says shaved, it's not just shave your beard. I mean, shave your head, every part of their body. Why? Because the Egyptians feared lice. Guess what God will send during Moses' day for them just to wake them up? <laughs> a bunch of lice. But they, they, he's all shaved. He's got a headpiece on because he's probably outside and everything. And he's got mascara that would make Tammy Faye Baker envious. I mean, he, it's all going that way. You know what I'm saying? There's no way possible they would recognize him. And they don't recognize his voice because he's speaking Egyptian to them and uh, through an interpreter, but he's hearing everything they're saying because he knows Hebrew. That's his native language. So that's what's happening. That's what we see here. Uh, and that's what's going on. So um, <clears throat> then let's go on here. Look, you know, forgiveness. I want to talk about that. Forgiveness separates the men from the boys, folks. A lot of people talk about forgiveness. They talk a good game in church. But when it gets down to forgiving your enemies, <laughs> no way, Jose. It's easy to love those who love you. That's, that, that didn't, anybody can do that. Try loving those who despise and lie about you and sell you into slavery. Try that for, out for size. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, 44, listen to what Jesus had to say. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, and he's talking to Dan Maxwell, he's talking to you. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Folks, Jesus is talking about doing major league Christianity here. This is not go to church, sing a song, pray a prayer, give a buck, hear a sermon, and go home and do your thing. That's religion, and religion will send you to hell. Religion's no different than Buddhism, Mohammedism, Confucius. I hate re religion's the greatest enemy that Satan cooked up to get as many people into hell as possible. I hate religion with, a, you say, well, you're a pastor. You can't hate religion. Oh, yes, I do. Because I do not serve a religious God. 
I serve the God. I serve, I have a relationship with a risen, living God, not some beer belly Buddha. Amen? And so, um, but Joseph is going to test his brothers. Verse 9, then Joseph remembered um, the dreams which he had dreamed about them, and he said to them, you are spies. You are spies. What did they say to him when he came down to check on them for his dad? You came down here to spy on us. And then they threw him in a pit, and we're going to kill him. They remember what the brothers did? And now it looks like things turned around. You are spies. Hmm. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. You've come to find some advantage to take over. And they said to him, no, no, my Lord, but your servants have come just to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. I can almost hear him go, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> your servants are not spies. Well, that might be true. Joseph is wisely opening up lovingly, but very precisely, this old wound to see if they had changed or not. And God guided him to do this. So the, the, it says that he spoke roughly to them. So, um, and he knows Benjamin's missing because there's just 10 of them. That, the dream was 11. So the dream is not completely full yet, but it's going to get full in weeks to come, folks. We haven't got there yet. We won't get there today. Verse 12. But he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And the fact, the youngest is, not, is with our father today, and one is no more. Who's the no more kid? And that's him. I remember my dad got my brother and I a dog. We begged him for a dog. I mean, my, you know, so we got a dog. My dad wasn't too hot on getting a dog because he wanted to make sure we take care of it. So we promised, you know how kids do. So my brother and I said, oh, oh yeah, you know, we're going to take care of this dog. So we, he brings this dog home. And he said, uh, here's the dog's name, Nomo. I thought, what? And my dad said his name is Nomo because after he's gone, there won't be no more. <laughs> <laughs> so it uh, made me think of Nomo, the dog. We kept him till he went to dog heaven or hell. I'm not sure which one he went to, but uh, he, he could be a little mean, <laughs> but that's all right. But let me go on. Notice they were suspicious, but you see, you have to understand that's the protocol of that day and time. They had to be, he had to be suspicious. They've got the world's food source. There's no other food in the world. They've got it. And what, guess what? Every country wants to take from them that food source. So he's got to check people out. You go with me to Israel today, and you, if you've ever been interrogated, you're going to get interrogated even today. When you, and it's not that they're out there. They don't like you. They, they love, the, but they've got to check people out for security reasons and things like that. It's still suspicious even to this day, but it was in that day and time too. So brothers are, are these, these are scoundrels. I mean, think about, they slaughtered the, um, uh, the uh, Shechemites. They, they killed them all, remember? The Judah slept with his daughter-in-law. Reuben slept with Belhad, uh, the, the concubine. Uh, 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 these are not, oh, yeah, we're honest men. Yeah, we, we, you know, we, well, yeah, we uh, sold our brother into slavery. But Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you, saying, you are spies. In this matter you shall be tested, Joseph said. By the life of Pharaoh. Now, he swears by the life of Pharaoh. That was a very common thing, but it's very powerful. And only someone in Joseph's position could make that statement. You shall not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. I want to see that young brother. 
Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. Now he could have put them in there for three years, but he puts them in there for three days. And that word for prison, um, the Hebrew word there, doesn't mean like a dungeon, but it, he put them in custody. But they couldn't go anywhere, but they were in cu- their, their freedom was removed. So it might have been a dungeon, I don't know, but it didn't say that like it did with uh, Joseph. But admitting guilt is the first step towards the grace of God. Many people come in for counseling, and, you know, I tell them right up front, I am not a Freudian-trained counselor. I am not here to tell you you don't have to blame yourself for stabbing your mother. You just had deeper inhibitions that had to be expressed. Let's blame somebody else for everything you've ever done. That's Freudian counseling predominantly. When people come in and they say, well, Pastor Dan, I just feel guilty. I don't know why I feel so guilty. I said, well, let me help you with that. And I'm not trying to be mean. But the reason you feel guilty is because you are. And the moment you accept the fact that you are guilty, you right then and there become a candidate for the grace of Almighty God. And he will forgive you, and you can walk out, and you don't have to come back and sit on some uh, sofa ever again. Amen? You're free. You're free by Almighty God who created you, every stitch of you. Amen? Amen? That's better than any Dr. Dry Buckets, amen? That's the grace of God. That's biblical counseling. That's what the Bible teaches. We should hang on to that. So he puts them in prison. Uh, The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, confess and find mercy. God wants to hear us to agree with him that it's sin. That's what homologeo in Greek, the word confess means, is to agree with what God is saying. Uh, so after 22 years, uh, he, they feel guilty. Now it's time to heal some of these wounds. God is a forgiving God. He's a gracious God. Verse 18, then Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. Now, that's the first time Joseph has mentioned the name of God in front of them, and that was a little, little test to see if they'd pick up on it. I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses. Take it back home. And bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. Now that's what Joseph came up with after these three days. He's talking to them and here's what uh, they said, verse 21. And they said to one another, now they're speaking in Hebrew, and he, Joseph, understands Hebrew is better than he probably understands Egyptian. And I know this doesn't mean anything to you, but this entire sentence, this is one of the few sentences in the entire Old Testament that is in what we call the emphatic imperative case i mean this is so it's like explanation points after every word here it goes we are truly guilty they said they said to one another we are truly guilty concerning our brother talking about joseph for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear Therefore, in light of this, this distress has come upon us. That's one of the most powerful verses of the Bible. They own their sin. They have finally come face to face with it, and Joseph's helped them with that, and God, and boom, it's right in front of them. God wants you to say to him, 
I blew it. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister. It's me. I can't put it off to someone else. Amen? Amen. And so, um, uh, <clears throat> now notice what Reuben, he's the oldest. He's going to have a word for him. And Reuben answered them and Again, Joseph is hearing all this and understands it. He's just being quiet now. He's not speaking. He's not speaking through the interpreter. He's listening. Here's what Reuben the oldest says. And remember, Reuben was the one that was coming back to save his life. He didn't want him to die. It was Simeon who threw him in there and wanted to sell him. It was Judah who got the money. Judas. But let's go on here. And Reuben answered them and saying, did I not speak to you, saying, here's the oldest brother talking to his younger brothers, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them. So there's no question. Joseph hears them, and he understands everything that's going on. For he spoke to them through an interpreter to mask that, that he understood Hebrew. And he turned himself away from them, Joseph did, and he laughed. Is that what it says? He wept. He's a godly man. He's a strong man. Look what he's gone through. But he wept. Then he returned to them again after weeping, and he talked with them, and he took Simeon, which was the next in line down from them, the one that wanted to put him in the pit, and bound him before their eyes. He's going to keep him in prison while they go home. Joseph weeps here. He turned himself away and wept. This week, I went through this, and I found that Joseph weeps six times. Six times. If I've counted them right, here they are. He weeps right here in this text. When we see, when he sees Benjamin come back, and we'll see that in weeks to come, he's going to weep again. When he reveals himself to his brothers, ultimately, he's going to weep again. When he sees his father there for the first time, he'll weep again. When Jacob, his father, dies, he will weep. And when he assures at the, uh, kind of towards the end, his brothers of forgiveness, he weeps the sixth time. Six times this man weeps. I don't see a crybaby. I see a real man crying. First time I ever held one of my children, I was right there. His, we named him Israel. He was born December the 5th, 1980. I got to Deaconess Hospital, and they were having more babies that day than they had ever had in their history. I think Israel was 52 or 53rd baby, and it was, he was born in the afternoon. I mean, they were still, and they were running. They had run out of stuff for me to even put on. I'm supposed to, I've taken all this Lamaze stuff, whatever you call it, and I uh, get in there and I put this shirt on and, and I just rip the back clear out of it because it, 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 it won't fit, and there's no pants. So I opened the door and this lady's going by and I said, Get me some, uh, some, some stuff, stat. <laughs> I didn't really know what stat meant, but I thought it would make, make her hurry a bit. And so, so she got it. I put it on, got in there, and Jeannie had Israel. When they handed him to me, I thought, he looks like something from outer space. What's wrong with him? <laughs> so, <laughs> but I started boo-hooing like crazy. And... Uh, there was no room for Jeannie in the inn. <laughs> they had to put her in the hallway. So I thought, I, you know, 
And I was taught in this Lamaz thing that, you know, women get a little bit weirdo after uh, this. And so I, you know, just get used to it. And I forgot that. I guess I was going to cheer her up. I, I'm just goofing around. I went up and I said, oh, babe, you know, because we had planned we were going to name him Israel. I said, hey, I, I decided to name him something different. I've already signed the paper. It's all done. I can't do anything about it now. She said, well, what did you name him? I said, you'll love it. I named him Bullwinkle. <laughs> and I said, the next one we'll name Rocky, all right? So, wow. And she starts crying. I thought, oh, no, what did I do? And uh, you know, so, please, no, I na- he's Israel. It's Israel all the way, just like we thought. I'm just goofing around, you know, so... Uh, uh, men, you got, came to church and you learned something today. Don't name your kid Bullwinkle. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just kidding you. But also, with charity, it was the same. I was there when Faith was born, and I held her start weeping like every one of my grandkids. When I picked them up, I couldn't hold back my emotions. That's, I'm sure you're very much the same way. Joseph couldn't hold them either. It was an expression of love. It was an expression of his heart. <clears throat> and so, uh, let me quickly move on. The brothers hid for home, ultimately. So they and their donkeys and the grain departed with them. And you know what's going to happen here? Joseph's going to pay for their grain. He takes his own money, and he puts the money back in their grain sacks. So what we see here, it's what I'm trying to say, consider the goodness and the severity of God. Verse 25, then Joseph gave a command to all the sacks with grain to restore every man's money to his sack and to give them provision for the journey. Thus he did for them. That's how I know he paid for it himself. Joseph had their money put back in their sacks, provision for the next journey, because why? He wants them to come back. He didn't know maybe they're out of money. He wants to make sure this is not going to cost them anything. They, get, they, they travel out to what they would call an encampment inn. That's where there's a little place for, to feed the animals and just like lean-tos of nothing. I mean, it's just nothing in the desert, and that's where they get to. And so uh, let's pick up the story here, verse 27. But as one of them opened his sack, one of the brothers, to give his donkey feed at the encampment, this encampment inn, he saw his money, and there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored, and there it is. It's in my sack. Then, my, then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done to us? Huh. Now, Joseph paid for it, put it on there. You would think they would be happy, wouldn't you? But you see, they had to leave their brother back, and I thought, oh, they're going to think we stole this money. Every one of their sacks. Let me tell you this, folks, in passing. I don't have time to develop it. Guilt turns blessings into distress. Guilt will turn your blessings into distress. It aroused a sense of shame inside of them. You can't enjoy your blessings when you are in sin. And so, verse 29, we're going to finish up here. Then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But he said to him, We are honest men. I can see Jacob rolling his eyes. We are not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father, who, and there's one who is no more. And the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me so that I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and then you may trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money, each man, was in his sack. 
And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. Wow. They said, look what God has done, not for us, but to us. I tell you what, go down here to Crest, buy $300 worth of groceries. Bring it home, and as you're taking it out, you know, maybe just one sack, who knows? <laughs> and uh, so you're taking it out, and there is $300 in there. You're not going to say, look what, what God has done to me. You're going to say, praise God. <laughs> you know, praise the Lord. God's blessed me. But when you have unconfessed sin, it's hard to get blessed, even when you do get blessed. Amen? It's love your enemies. Here's what I always say. Love your enemies. It'll drive them nuts. And it's driving his brothers nuts. And it's exactly what Joseph knew it would do. So Jacob makes it all about himself. Verse 36, Jacob, their father, said to them, you have betrayed me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want me to take Benjamin as these are against me. And he's all upset about that. And, but in closing here, Jacob is living in the pain of the past. And he says, verse 38, but he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead. Joseph's dead. And he is left alone. He's the last one I've got from Rachel. If any uh, calamity should befall uh, him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair and sorrow in the grave. And I want to conclude real quick. Why, these bad, why do bad things happen to good people? Number one, to save the world from famine. That's why it happened. God, synergy... He put it all together so he could save the world. This is the only place there's food. God in his grace. He had it all working, but you didn't understand it at the time it was happening, but he's putting the pieces together. That's the synergy of God. All things work together for good to them that love God. Also, to bring Israel to Egypt. He's going to bring that whole family down there. And Joseph's going to give them the land of Goshen. And they're going to be able to be there for 400 years. Yes, they'll be as slaves, but they will grow to nearly 3 million people, 12 tribes. And then on top of that, to preserve the lineage of the Messiah. The whole thing was so that Jesus Christ, they could go back to the 12 tribes, ultimately from the tribe of Judah will come King David, and out of King David will ultimately come the Lord Jesus Christ, and hallelujah, we're here today because of Joseph there. It all came together. All things worked together for good, for good to them and love God and are called according to his purpose. Only Almighty God can figure that out. Amen. Only God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Today, if you are trying to figure out how, Pastor Dan, how all things work together for good, oh, my friend, just believe it, and it will be a soft pillow for your tired and well heart. Would you bow with me? You may not understand all I preached on today. But you say, Pastor Dan, I'm not certain. If I died at this very moment, I'd go to heaven. I'm just not sure. I'm not sure either. But let's make sure. Don't leave here today without telling the Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing me here so that I can say yes to you. Today, say yes to Jesus. He's trying to bless you with the greatest blessing you would ever know. Eternal life through his shed blood. Today, if you hear his voice, hearten. Right now, as the Spirit of God is speaking, would you pray with me in your heart of hearts? Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. Come and live in my heart. 
Forgive me of my sin and save my eternal soul. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you meant that with all your heart, God bless you. We're not trying to point you out or embarrass you, but the moment we stand, we're going to give an invitation. Would you come and, and just say, I pray to receive Christ. I want to. I'm not ashamed of him. I'll pray with you, encourage you. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to give a thing. We just want to help you. Maybe you say, we want to be a part of a church that believes the Bible, teaches the Bible, upholds God's holy, precious word. That's the kind of church we want to be a part of. If that's your heart, we'd be honored to have you. Just come and let us know. We'll handle all the things as church membership. If you want to do that, you come the moment we stand. Maybe you just want to come and pray at the altar. That'd be fine. You do what God tells you to do. Father, take now this simple message. May it bring glory to you and you alone. In your holy name, I pray. Let's stand. I'll meet you right here at the front.